Live from Kelloland Television, a Kelloland News Special, U.S. House Debate. Now your moderators, Don Jorgensen and Sammy B. Ellen. Good evening. In a few weeks, South Dakota voters will decide who will fill South Dakota's lone seat in the U.S. House of Representatives. That's right. And before you head to the polls, we want to help you get to know the candidates. Joining us tonight are Democrat Tim Bjorkman and Republican Dusty Johnson. They are also facing Libertarian George Hendrickson and Independent Ron Wizorek. Kelloland Media Group invited all four candidates to participate. They needed to prove that they meet the criteria used by every next star station across the country. Our parent company requires things like physical campaign office, a phone number, and a minimum amount of campaign donations. Both Hendrickson and Wazorek didn't meet the criteria. You can read the full criteria at Kelloland.com. We also want to note, even if they are not involved in today's debate, Kelloland News will cover every candidate's campaign and include their information on air and online. Over the next hour, we are going to be asking former Judge Tim Bjorkman and former Public Utilities Commissioner Dusty Johnson your questions. First, the candidates each have one minute to tell you about themselves and why they believe they should be South Dakota's next representative in Congress. And the two flipped a coin just a few minutes ago to determine the order, and we begin with Mr. Mr. Johnson, you have one minute for opening statement. Well, thanks very much. I am Dusty Johnson. I'm running for Congress. I want to start by recognizing my family. I've got my wonderful wife, Jacqueline, here, as well as two of our three sons. We've got Max and Ben here. Six-year-old Owen is watching at home. Uh, I'm a Mitchell businessman, uh, part owner of an engineering firm, and it's a great South Dakota-based business. I served our state on the Public Utilities Commission, where I was a fierce advocate for ratepayers. I served us as chief of staff, where I was a prime architect of eliminating a $127 million budget deficit. You know, I'm the solutions-focused, optimistic candidate. I don't think we need to look to Washington, D.C. to solve all our problems. Instead, I think we need to look to South Dakota first, make sure that we're returning power to South Dakota families, businesses, and communities. I'm Dusty Johnson, and that's the positive South Dakota first vision that I want to bring, I want to take from our state to Washington. All right. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Next up, Mr. Bjorkman, you have one minute to address South Dakota. I've lived my life in Canastota uh, for the last 30 years, along with my wife Kay, where we raised our four sons. I've done a lot of physical work in life and served as a missionary, a small town lawyer, on the parole board, and as a judge. We all know that Congress is controlled by special interests. That's why health care costs twice that of other nations and why Wall Street thrives while Main Street and rural South Dakota struggle. And we won't fix Congress by sending more career politicians who take their money. That's why, unlike Dusty, who's taken over 220000 of the special interest dollars, I've rejected it all. No PACs, just people serving people. And I'll stand sentinel to guard your Social Security and Medicare from the pending attacks. And I'll work across the aisles to lower the costs of health care and ensure that every South Dakotan can afford to see a doctor when sick. You know, just as no one can serve two masters, our congressmen can't serve both the special interests and the people. Time. You've got to choose. Thank you. Now, before we get started, we just want to let you know this is not a traditional debate. The answers are not timed, but we may cut in if a candidate gets off topic. All right, so let's get started. America is divided right now. A new poll from CBS News finds that 84% of registered voters in competitive districts think the tone and the civility of politics mm -hmm. are getting worse. And that leads us to our first viewer question from Lori. She wants to know, on a national level, what are your plans to reunite our currently divided country? Mr. Johnson, you go first. Well, I think the first thing we've got to start by doing is, is focus on solutions and, and build bridges. Uh, I mean, I think you can tell just from our opening statements. I mean, I talked about my vision for South Dakota, my vision for this country. You know, uh, Tim talked about me. And I understand that in politics that's very tempting. You always want to focus on the other guy. But I think if we're really going to make progress, abiding progress, progress that can help future generations, we really do have to make sure that we're working across the aisle. Now, the good news is I've got a track record in this area. Uh, when I served on the State Public Utilities Commission, we were a bipartisan commission for most of that time. And I, I don't know exactly, but I would bet I cast about 2,000 votes on the commission. And fewer than a half dozen of them broke along party lines. 
I think that shows I have a real track record of folks uh, focusing on solutions and on trying to make progress rather than just uh, making political points. All right. Thanks, Mr. Johnson. Mm -hmm. Mr. Bjorkman, uh, how do you reunite our divided country? Well, Dusty, you and I aren't the problem. Uh, and I don't view you as the real opponent in this mm -hmm. election. My opponents are the special interests and the big party mm -hmm. leaders in Washington who I think are responsible for so much of the polarization this country faces. The special interest money uh, rolls into them and they even use our congressmen through the process of congressional dues that sells our committees that we send our congressmen to serve on uh, based on how lucrative they are for fundraising. It's an offensive practice and it's highly divisive and it makes it very hard for our leaders uh, th that we send to Congress to work across the aisles. So I think the, the biggest thing is we've got to beat back the special interest money controlling our Congress. And you know, the other thing is our tone and tenor with one another has to change. And it has to begin with respectful discourse that uh, treats everyone as though they're an American patriot because we all want the, the same things. Sometimes we have different means of, of getting there. And Dusty and I, you'll hear, uh, share s several of the same views. But we have to be honest in talking about real problems if we're going to get real solutions. And sometimes those are hard conversations. You know, I, I do just want to mention because, you know, sometimes during a political campaign you get information thrown out that isn't quite accurate. And I just want to make sure that everybody at home knows that, I mean, I've won a national award for how local my race is. There's an independent uh, national news outlet that looked at all of the congressional candidates across our country and named Dusty Johnson the most local congressional candidate. And I'm absolutely proud of the fact that we've had almost 4,000 people donate to this campaign, our most common donation. But what does that have to do with the question of reuniting well, our well, country? Well, because we've got, you know, uh, Tim talked about, you know, big money. And Dusty's taken more than $200,000. And I think the reality is it's important for us to acknowledge that uh, my campaign is the most local campaign in the country, Don. Okay. Well, that brings us to our next question. Can I comment on that since he raised it? Sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Well... Dusty's quoting a statistics that aren't entirely accurate. We have so many small donations, and actually we have far more donations than Dusty, over 4,600, but they're much smaller in amount. And so those unitemized donations don't show addresses. Our local contributors, South Dakota contributors, far outstrip Dusty's. Okay, thank you both. We're going to move on now to our next question. Election forecasting site 538 gives Democrats an 85% chance of flipping the U.S. House of Representatives. Either way, viewers want to know how you will get along with people on the other side of the aisle. Nancy asks, what has been your more significant collaboration with your opposing party that had a positive impact for South Dakota and quality of life? Mr. Bjorkman, this question goes to you first. Great question. Uh, first of all, I served on the parole board, and uh, I was one of the few Democrats, sometimes maybe the only one. And so I've developed a lot of close relationships with people across party lines there. And then in my terms uh, on the bench, uh, formed deep relationships that don't really have anything to do with partisanship. It's just problem solving and working with others. And I share that concern about uh, the, the partisan divide. And you know, this is likely to be a very closely divided Congress, no matter uh, which way it turns out. I'm tired of party politics. I'm tired of finger pointing. I'm tired of, of people who don't want to get work done for the people. And I think they should all come home. That's why I've not only called for new le leadership in both houses of Congress, I've made it clear I'm not supporting uh, Nancy Pelosi or any of the current leadership uh, regime on the Democratic side. I think we need a change of the guard, a fresh approach. I want to go to Washington to build relationships with my fellow congressmen and women from across party lines because I think that's an important first step to trying to accomplish work, get to know the other individuals. All right, thank you. Mr. Johnson, go ahead. Well, if you want to talk about my most uh, significant collaboration with the other party, it would probably be with my mother. Uh, my mother's a Democrat, and of course I love her. And there are times when we talk politics, and I think it's important to, for everybody to know that, we, of course, we respect one another. And uh, I don't view the Democrats in this country as the enemy at all. There are fellow Americans. Uh, I've already talked about my time on the Public Utilities Commission and how uh, often Commissioner Colbeck and I work together. And I, 
that's something that I think sometimes we lose uh, an appreciation for. I mean, the Republicans aren't always right. The Democrats aren't always wrong. And if we're willing to take the best from both ideas, I do think we're in a much stronger position to move this country forward. All right, thank you very much. All right, our next question. Well, there is a lot happening in our country right now and across the world that keeps every day South Dakotans worried and anxious. What keeps you up at night? Mr. Johnson, you get the question. Well, I've got three young sons. And I think anytime you've got children, you are willing to think more about the long term. You're, you're less concerned about today. I mean, of course, you're concerned about the day-to-day -day concerns. But uh, more than that, you wonder, uh, am I going to be able to keep my children safe? Uh, are, are they growing up in a world uh, that they will be able to feel secure in? Uh, does a $21 trillion debt, are we passing that on to them? Is there a chance that we're bankrupting our country because we continue to want to spend more and more and more money? Uh, just on a personal level, I have to tell you, I, I'm sometimes concerned about uh, the cynicism and the anger that we see in society. I mean, we've got uh, 40 million Americans that are suffering from uh, mental health issues. Are we doing enough to get them help? Are we making sure that they're growing up in a world like my children are growing up in? I mean, we want that world to be much better. And those are the things that keep me up at night. Okay, thank you, Mr. Johnson. Mr. Bjorkman, what keeps you up at night? Well, Don, we raised four sons, uh, three of whom served in the Iraqi War era in the United States Army. And they're having children now. And so these precious new lives that are coming into the world uh, really have struck Kay and I in a way that uh, nothing else, else has before. And uh, when I looked into the eyes of our first granddaughter, I had to ask, what kind of a nation are we leaving behind for her and her children and, and uh, her generation? And uh, you know, the reality is this. They are not going to be able to afford the financial costs if we don't um, start controlling our spending, but also treating the needs of people who I saw in the court system. And so Dusty is exactly right about mental health. I've made that a hallmark of my campaign. And one of the things that's so hard as a judge, I saw on the bench what a cost we pay as a society for failing to timely treat mental health. And, uh, you know, again, we've got to talk about reality. And Dusty, while he was chief of staff, as he talked about, uh, had a prime opportunity to use this state as a laboratory uh, with other states to expand Medicaid. It was a, a bad decision that we have paid for dearly. It's cost us 300 to $500 million every year, Don. We're sending our federal tax dollars there, but we're not uh, getting money back to, to help treat our needs, while North Dakota and a lot of other Republican states are. So uh, it's because of that that uh, Sheriff Milstad here in Sioux Falls is the largest provider of mental health services in the state. And uh, we've okay. got to do better, and we've got to devote funds to treat needs. All right, thank you. Next question. On day 30 of your term, if you're elected, what do you want to be your biggest accomplishment? Mr. Bjorkman, this one goes to you first and we'll have you answer. Yeah, well, first of all, I want to see real progress working across the aisle with the administration and with uh, Republicans and Democrats alike to help drive down the cost of health care. Sammy, there's no bigger issue in our budget uh, or in our country. It's an economic drag on working families. It keeps employers from paying wages that they could otherwise pay. It keeps middle class families from getting ahead. It impacts our international competitiveness because our employers have to build that cost into every product that they market overseas. And it's hampering our budget incredibly. We spend $1.5 trillion on health care in this country uh, at the federal government level. We pay twice what uh, other uh, nations in Europe and Canada pay for health care. If we would just get our health care spending in line with uh, the other nations, we would cut $750 billion annually from our deficit. So even with uh, Congress and the administration spending recklessly over the last year and driving our budget up so by 80 percent, we'd still get uh, I believe that was the question. Work, work across the aisle to get the cost of health care down, down, and to see to it that everyone who's sick can afford to see a doctor. Thank you very much. 
Mr. Johnson, what do you hope to accomplish in 30 days if you are elected? Well, of course we need progress on health care, but I think uh, that's maybe asking a bit much in the first 30 days. So what I would want to be a top accomplishment is getting that farm bill moved. Uh, the farm bill is supposed to be reauthorized this year. It looks like Congress has run out of time. And so we're going to need somebody on the Ag Committee in 2019 who is going to be prepared to make sure that that conference committee uh, marries the best parts of the Senate bill up with the best parts of the House bill. Let's get that thing passed through. Let's get the president's signature on it. It would be hard to overstate how important, important that farm bill is to our agricultural producers. Uh, next to good weather, predictability is a farmer and I suppose a rancher's best friend. And right now, until we know what that next five years under the farm bill looks like, our producers do not have the kind of predictability that I know they, they deserve. Yeah, and you know, I think that's a very good point. And the reason we don't have a farm bill today, Sammy, is because a highly partisan House Republican uh, chair of the Ag Committee made that the most partisan farm bill in history. The Senate passed a bipartisan bill, didn't happen in the House. They couldn't get reconciled in time to resolve this. So I think it's important we work across the aisle to work with conservationists, farmers, ranchers. I think we might be talking about it. this a little bit later on, too, in our debate, mm -hmm. so That's we'll right. leave it right Save something now. back, right? That's yeah. right. A new report by the U.N. carries a strong warning. The world has a little more than a decade to take action, or it may be too late to reverse the worst effects of climate change. We're going to ask the candidates about that and other hot-button issues facing America next as our U.S. House debate continues in less than two minutes. Welcome back to our U.S. House debate. Now let's get into some of the issues. Viewers sent in a couple of questions about veterans health care, but we want to bring you uh, from a, a one from a retired veteran with disabilities who served in Ara Operation Iraqi Freedom. Michael asks, what is your position on veteran services and health and what have you been doing actively to help veterans? Mr. Johnson, we're going to begin with you. Well, I come from a military family. Uh, my mother traveled around the globe. Uh, she was uh, the daughter of uh, a, a military man. And so I uh, have always grown up with stories uh, from grandpa and from uh, mom telling me about the importance of uh, being in the United States Army. And it's something that's very important to me. And, and we, of course, do owe our veterans a lot. I think if there are a couple of things we can do to make sure that we're helping veterans, the first would be make good on the promises we've already made. Uh, there are some people who want to uh, dismantle the VA health care system. Uh, that's a terrible idea. So many parts of the VA, at least the delivery of care, are working pretty well. The bureaucracy is a mess, of course. We can improve that. But one thing we shouldn't do is uh, turn back uh, the promises that we've made uh, to our veterans. Now, a second important thing that I think we can do is be uh, wise and cautious before we put our men and women in uniform in harm's way. We should not be putting boots on the ground unless we have a clear and present danger to American interests. Uh, of course, our, our world needs American leadership, but we can't afford to be the world's policemen. So part of the question, the tail end, was about what, what do I actively do to help veterans? And during this campaign, I would bet there hasn't been a day that has gone by that I haven't talked to a South Dakota veteran. Uh, the most important thing, I think, uh, as a candidate that you have to remember is that this is a job interview and it's also an opportunity to learn. So uh, in the same way that I'm there sharing my story with them, I make sure that I, I allow time for them to share their story with me. And the stories I've heard about uh, the bureaucracy of the VA or about the, how terrible it is to come home with wounds that maybe people can't see, but that are just as real as the external scars, uh, have made it very clear to me that uh, taking care of veterans is going to be a top priority for me in Congress. Can I ask you, how, how, do, you, how do you improve that bureaucracy? Well, I, at, at some point, when you watch these, uh, these oversight hearings that Congress does, when they're hauling in VA officials, it, it seems like so many of their questions are about making a point. I mean, they're, they're pandering to the cameras. And, and I wonder if it wouldn't be better if they actually turned the cameras off, went into a committee room, sat down Republicans and Democrats, and just said, okay, exactly what do we need to get done? I mean, is it, is it more money in this area? Can we save money here and shift it over to getting uh, better qualified nurses who understand PTSD? I mean, I'm no expert on the VA delivery system, but I would tell you, uh, I think our politicians can talk a great game about veterans, 
But so often these things continue to come down to partisan votes. I, we have got to be better than that. Okay, thank you, Mr. Johnson. Mr. Bjorkman, question goes to you. Your thoughts on veteran health care and maybe ways to improve it. Yeah, thank you, Don. Well, as I mentioned, three of our sons served in the Iraqi war era. And, you know, our family, like hundreds of thousands of South Dakotans, understand the high price that our soldiers pay and that the war doesn't end when they get home. So I want to just talk about three things that we need to improve, in my view. First is, we have disability claims that can last up to, to can take up to seven years to resolve. That is terrible. These men and women who served us have their lives on hold while their case is going through the bureaucracy. So I uh, will fight for fast case treatment, more administrative law judges. That's the first thing, to get the cases addressed quicker. Second thing, veterans caregivers benefits. Uh, we have them for post 9-11 veterans. If you become paralyzed, for example, taking a bullet uh, for a fellow soldier, whatever the case may be, Post 9-11 veterans actually get benefits uh, for that caregiver who's giving up a job often to, to provide care. But pre-9-11 veterans have never had that. And that's just an injustice uh, I've been writing and talking about since I got into this race. Now there was a, a bill uh, to authorize pre-9-11 caregivers benefits, but it hasn't been fully funded yet. We need to get that funded. I'll fight for that um, justice for veterans. The third thing is that uh, the Veterans Choice Program has a, has a lot of problems with it. We've been to veteran service offices and talked to veterans all across the state, and we've heard complaints that the VA, uh, in many cases, didn't pay uh, for treatment like eye exams and so on, and so the veteran didn't get his eyeglasses, uh, or she didn't get treatment for her, her uh, mental health issue. That's just an abomination, and so I'll be an advocate to fight for that. Those are three big things I think we can do better. Mr. Johnson, you have something to add? Well, yeah, and I think an incredibly important uh, obligation that falls to the, a member of the South Dakota delegation is taking care of Hot Springs. I mean, anybody who has ever been to Hot Springs uh, has seen how that community rallies around that VA facility. It is, and this is no exaggeration, one of the globe's best treatment areas for PTSD. And, and it's excellent at all kinds of behavioral health issues. Now, we have had some within the VA who have been trying to shut down that facility for years. The outcomes out of the Hot Springs uh, facility are too good. Uh, we, we, it is a fantastic place for our veterans to go and heal. I think our delegation has done an excellent job of making sure the VA makes the right decision rather than the wrong decision. And I will fight like heck to continue to have that be the case. Mr. Bjorkman. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm a strong advocate for the VA remaining intact uh, in Hot Springs. It's not only that it's a great uh, treatment facility. It can be expanded uh, fully to staff dual diagnosis treatment, and there's a huge need for it in that uh, geographic area. And it also serves our natives. People have moved to the Hot Springs area over the decades specifically for VA care. We need to honor the commitments we've made to them and keep that in place. Plus, Hot Springs is such a beautiful therapeutic place, a great place to heal. All right, thank you very move. much. Thank you, guys. Guns continue to be a hot topic in this midterm election. Where do you stand on the balance between the Second Amendment and gun control? Mr. Bjorkman, you're up first. Well, I don't think there has to be any balance. Uh, the Second Amendment is part of the Constitution, Sammy. Uh, that's the law. The Supreme Court rules on it. Uh, so I think that there are some common sense things we can do uh, to reduce gun violence uh, while protecting the constitutional rights of the vast number of lawful gun owners uh, to own their guns and enjoy them in however they want. I come from a family of gun owners. Um, I am a gun owner myself. Uh, and, and you know, I also as a judge saw how the benefit of the protection order process can help defuse violence. Uh, when one person is threatening behavior to another. But what we don't have is cases to address when one person is threatening an unspecified group of people. For example, school shootings, where in 60% of those cases, someone knew. Someone knew it was going to happen. And so one key thing we can do is adopt red flag laws that allow a quick uh, temporary protection hearing 
with sworn statements and then an expedited hearing where both sides can be heard and allow guns temporarily to be removed just like they can in a protection order case in our state today uh, where there's a spousal issue or two people fighting over, over a boundary. So that's one. Second thing is we should expand our registries to uh, have universal uh, uh, ba or excuse me, background checks, to have universal background checks. Uh, and private transactions, in my view, uh, should be able to be accomplished at your local police station or sheriff's office. Private uh, gun owners shouldn't have to pay to have that done. I think that's, a, that's something we can do to help facilitate the process, and people ought to be able to pass on their guns to the next generation without going through that process. I think we need to look at the Sandy Hook promise that tries to identify at-risk kids and um, work with them because a lot of the school shooters uh, struggle between suicide and, and homicide and there are some real issues that they identify that we can address. And finally, we've got to keep in mind that 60% of the gun deaths are suicides and 90% of those are people who are mentally ill when they took their lives. So we've got to address the important role, again, of mental health care in treating people's needs. All right. Thank you, Mr. Bjorkman. Mr. Johnson, where do you stand between the Second Amendment and the gun control debate? Well, I'm a proud a proponent of the Second Amendment. I am uh, incredibly skeptical of uh, any idea that would restrict the rights of law-abiding gun owners. And so when I think about gun control, I think uh, more about the responsibility that I think any gun owner has to have. Uh, just a few weekends ago, my two older sons and I went out and uh, shot shotguns. I think people who own uh, handguns or own uh, any kind of gun, shotguns, rifles, I think they have an obligation to make sure that they know how to properly and respectfully use them. I think that Second Amendment right comes with some obligations. I think you have to make sure that your, your firearms are properly stored. Of course, we have, uh, we've got locks, gun locks, on, on any firearm that we've got in our home. And Tim's right. I mean, Tim and I agree that uh, mental health is, is an underappreciated problem when it comes to our nation's violence. 60% uh, of uh, gun deaths are suicides. And so things like bump stocks and cartridge size are not going to save those lives. I mean, we are a country that is struggling under the burdens of a massive mental health problem. We have 100 uh, drug overdose deaths a day. We have 100 suicides a day. And as I mentioned before, we've got 40 million adults who are suffering with mental health problems. And that's what we need to be focusing on. Uh, you know, it, it's fine to have a conversation about the guns, but when people want to talk about the guns, they're normally concerned about the behavior of people who are struggling. And we need to help the people. That's how we're going to make real progress. Thank you very much. Let's, we're going to have to move on here. Under a Republican president and a Republican-controlled Congress, the GOP was unable to successfully repeal the Affordable Care Act. So where does the future of this law stand? What do you say to the nearly 30,000 South Dakotans who signed up through healthcare.gov? We begin with Mr. Johnson on this question. Well, first off, I want to say to anybody who uh, has pre-existing conditions that, uh, of course, I acknowledge that whatever system we have has to cover those pre-existing conditions. And uh, that's a commitment that I'm happy to make. I think if we're really going to improve health care, we've got to start uh, working better on some long-term long strategies. Uh, we're not doing a good enough job with wellness. We're not doing a good enough job with case management. Over time, those can bend these cost curves, and they can result in billions of dollars of savings to our country and to taxpayers, and an incredible increase in the quality of life. I think we also need to do a better job of contracting with providers. Uh, as chief of staff, I had a lot of experience in not just uh, paying providers to run the machine one more time, but entering into some more innovative approaches where we start paying providers for outcomes. Make sure that their interests are well aligned with the patients and well aligned with uh, the employer or with the government that's helping to pay for that. Now, I don't think we are going to get that kind of innovation, that kind of progress with a one-size-fits-all solution from Washington. I mean, what we've got right now gives us an opportunity to all fail together. We know it's not working. You're not happy with what you're paying for health care. I'm not talking to anybody who's happy with what they're paying for health care. Affordability is a real problem. And I think we can use the power of states. Give them unfettered flexibility, or at least 
uh, you know, uh, uh, an incredible amount of flexibility for them to innovate and find new ways to do this case management, to do this wellness, and to do this working with providers. I think if we give Kentucky and Minnesota and Tennessee an opportunity to innovate, we're going to find we get much, much better outcomes. All right. Thanks, Mr. Johnson. Mr. Bjorkman. Thank you. Well, we already have that kind of innovation that Dusty's talking about with Medicaid expansion. South Dakota, under Dusty's uh, time in uh, the governor's office, just rejected it. And I mentioned that earlier, how costly that's been. Uh, devastating impacts all across our communities because we're not treating mental health and then the addiction that often grows into that. And it uh, rips across the fabrics of our community. So the Affordable Care Act, an imperfect first attempt to get uh, the kind of um, health care that every American can see a doctor when, when they're sick and can afford it. So the basic problem uh, that we have is health care costs too much and it leaves too many people out. The current administration and the Republican Party promised us better, cheaper health care that would cover everyone. That promise has not come through. Uh, the Republican House couldn't, uh, couldn't get through the Senate a, uh, a plan and it's a mercy that it uh, didn't pass because it would have been devastating taking 23 more million Americans off the rolls of health care. So three big things. One, we've got to get everybody into coverage as early as they can and get them accessible to treatment and have them pay what they, what they can pay. Two, the biggest drivers of health care beyond uh, the fact that we leave so many people out of timely care and then we pay dearly for it all through society is big pharma uh, and the skyrocketing costs of pharmaceutical care and then uh, the high costs of insurance administration. I want to just touch on those briefly. Congress has prohibited, big, uh, prohibited our Congress from negotiating with using its bulk purchasing power to lower the cost of, health, of uh, pharmaceuticals with big pharma. That's got to change. It's solely a factor of the special interest control that big pharma uh, uses over Congress. And so we need to send people who will push back that uh, kind of um, uh, special interest control. The second thing is when Congress tried to lower the cost of our drugs so that we could pay in this country what Europe and Canada pay instead of the two to seven, sometimes ten times more than that, the Senate struck it down and it was bipartisan. Ten Democrats joined with Republicans, but every one of them got big money from Big Pharma who voted against it. So we've got to stand up to those uh, costs and address them and we've got to address health care uh, costs in terms of insurance and right. offer a public option to people so they can buy into Medicare if they can't have affordable health care otherwise. Thank you. We, we need to move on to the next question. Thank you both. Yeah. Thank you. In a new report, scientists say climate change is getting worse and there could be serious consequences in the next 20 years. The United Nations reports that at the current warming rate, millions more people will die from extreme heat by the year 2040. There will also be substantial loss of coral reefs and a rise in sea levels that could wipe out small island nations like the Bahamas. More than 90 scientists from 40 countries wrote the more than 700-page report. What are you going to do about climate change? Mr. Bjorkman, this question goes to you first. Well, we first have to start out with a common set of facts. Uh, the facts are overwhelming that climate change is occurring. Uh, you can see what's happening at the Arctic Circle and the ice melt uh, through photographs. And we see it all over the world in various degrees. But when you've got uh, government leadership who's in denial about these real problems that will have um, lasting effects on our whole civilization, there's reason to be alarmed. So the first thing is we've got to come to a common set of understanding uh, of the facts that climate change is real. And then we've got to look at the opportunities we have to address this um, huge problem in our country timely. And, uh, you know, green technology is one of the great sources of um, development that we have looking forward. So I think we need to encourage the development of, you know, solar and wind and ethanol, these, these big, uh, cleaner, environment friendly types of technologies. And it's got to start with that basic acknowledgement that this is a real problem. 
Okay. Thank you, Mr. Bierkman. Mr. Johnson. Well, this is an area that uh, I know a fair amount about. Uh, to my knowledge, I'm the only public utilities commissioner who has testified in front of Congress on this topic. Uh, I was invited in to talk about the impact that some of these solutions to climate change can have on ratepayers. And uh, many of the proposals that have been brought up in the past have been a massive, multi-billion dollar uh, income distribution, redistribution scheme, taking money from our part of the country and moving it to the coasts. And, and I know we can do better than that. Uh, of course, uh, we, we can have environmental leadership. I think that's important. But I get concerned with my friends on the left when, when their idea of attacking climate change is scarcity. You know, you need to drive less, and you need to turn down the thermostat, and you need to make do with less. That is not what is going to solve this problem. Technology, innovation, that is what is going to make for a better environmental future. Now, we have already seen this. You know, America has been reducing its carbon intensity. You don't hear a lot about that. But the reality is that technology has made it easier for us to cheaply extract natural gas. So we've been using a lot more natural gas, and that has half the carbon intensity of coal. So we've been shutting down coal plants and using cleaner burning natural gas plants. At the same time, we've seen technology and innovation bring down the cost of renewable, uh, renewable energy plants. And that has made a big impact in reducing our carbon footprint. Now, I don't know what the technological breakthrough of next year or the year after that is going to be. Maybe it'll be battery technology. Maybe it'll be carbon sequestration. Maybe it'll be solar power. But I just know in my heart that if we're going to solve the climate change issue, it's going to come not from scarcity and not from bigger and bigger government, but it's going to come from technologic, uh, technological innovation. And I'll be a leader in uh, encouraging the private sector and our energy laboratories to do that kind of innovation when I'm in Congress. All right. Thank you, Mr. John said. Well, we have talked about some of the big issues facing America. Let's bring it closer to home. More viewer questions about the issues impacting South Dakotans when we come back. Welcome back to our U.S. House debate. Let's continue our questioning. Now, construction is set to begin soon on the Keystone XL pipeline in South Dakota. What does the future energy look like here? Would you consider another pipeline proposal through South Dakota if it was brought up again in Congress? We're going to begin with Mr. Johnson. Well, there isn't really a, a much of a role for Congress in this area. Uh, th these are decisions that are made, uh, you know, at the administrative level, both at the federal and at the state level. You'll have a public utilities commission that would issue a permit after they looked at all of the evidentiary record, and they're going to be guided by state law. I mean, that's their job. Does this pipeline meet its burden of proof that has been set uh, by our state legislators? And uh, at the federal level, again, you've got a, a pipeline uh, hazardous materials uh, safety commission. They're the folks who uh, review these types of construction plans. So there's not a role for Congress, at least not directly in these kinds of things. But I would say this. I know that we need to transition away from oil. I'm, I'm a big believer in biofuels, for instance. But we're going to have oil be an important, an important part of the American economy uh, for quite some time. And if we're going to be hauling these fuels from, I, I, I first should tell you, I'm way more interested in dealing with uh, Alberta and other areas of Canada than I am in dealing with the Middle East. I don't like being beholden to Middle Eastern countries, and I would much rather get our fuel from North America, including places like North Dakota, Texas, and Oklahoma. But of course, we have to haul that as well. And uh, everybody who's analyzed the data will tell you hauling it in a pipeline is safer, not perfectly safe, of course, but safer than doing it uh, via, via railroad or doing it by tanker on the highways. So uh, if, uh, if there was an issue before Congress that was going to ask whether or not we would just shut down all of the potential development, pass a federal law saying nobody could build a pipeline again, I would be opposed to that because I think we need to have standards uh, set in law and allow the facts of the case to drive whether or not that's a prudent decision. So Congress might have a role. Well, you know, normally they don't. I mean, they haven't before. Doesn't I mean, mean you're not going to hear No, that's though. absolutely right. So if, there were, if somebody brought a bill and they said, Dusty, should we prohibit the construction of any pipeline ever again, I would vote no. Okay, Mr. Bjorkman, your thoughts on another pipeline through South Dakota? Well, of course, I'd have to see the exact proposal, Don, but let me just say that I think it's... Uh, really an offense to private property landowners to see a foreign corporation come and take their land really against their will. Uh, so uh, Dusty poses this as an either or. Uh, it's either Canada or the Middle East. That's not really the issue. We've got to put a lot of effort into our own uh, development of 
clean technology, but we also are producing um, all kinds of uh, oil and natural gas in this country. Uh, we've made incredible gains. We can supply our own needs, and we need to work on being energy independent fully, developing technologies for the future instead of fossil fuel type technology. We can do a lot more to promote clean technology without having to bring more pipelines into this state. Thank you both. A 2016 report by the bipartisan New American Economy Report found more than 30,000 immigrants in South Dakota are playing a vital role in filling workforce gaps. That includes on the farm. Where do you balance the needs of South Dakota's economy in this immigration debate? <coughs> Mr. Bjorkman, you're first. Well, the first thing is, you know, immigrants are a rich and important part of our culture, and we've all uh, have that immigrant experience in our family's background. So we need to honor and respect as citizens those who are here uh, as citizens and, uh, and lawfully. And uh, the other thing is, we have workforce shortage all around the country, all across the nation, all across South Dakota. So we need to address those needs. The reason we have a need for immigrants, though, Sammy, is that we've got something like, in this country, 10 to 12 million Americans uh, who are of working age, not working, or looking for work. Those are the people I saw in court every day. Uh, they struggle with mental health uh, that's never been treated, and grows into addiction, and it becomes a ticket to jail instead of a way to get treatment. And they're not in the workforce. They don't have a way to get healthy because we haven't provided them access to treatment. And so crime's biggest enemy is a safe home growing up, an education and a job skill. That's where my focus is. Let's get these people to be tax-paying members of our society, good role models for their children, work the jobs that we need uh, to have filled. And as we do that, there should be less of a need to bring people in from outside the country. In the meantime, we have to, we have to provide opportunities for uh, farm workers and others to fill the jobs. Thank you, Mr. Bjorkman. Mr. Johnson, how do you address immigration and its impact on South Dakota's economy? Well, I want to start by telling people, you know, what I'm not for. I mean, I'm not for sanctuary cities. I think they're terrible. I don't think we should be abolishing ICE. You see a lot of people in D.C. talking about that these days. And I'm not for amnesty. I do think there is a vital role for immigration done properly. I mean, that's a huge part of the American success story. And if you want to work hard, uh, if you believe in American values, if you believe in the free market system, then, you know, you sound like you could be a pretty good American to me. But we need to acknowledge that there are millions of illegal immigrants in this country. And there are some in South Dakota, absolutely. I don't think anybody denies that. But we are a nation uh, that values the rule of law. And I think if you've broken the rules, if you've, blow, if you've broken the law, I don't think we can let you cut to the front of the line. We have got to hold you accountable when you break the rules. And so when we talk about immigration reform, I'm supportive of much of what the president is talking about. I think we can move to a, a more merit-based system. I think we can get rid of the visa lottery. I think we can reform how chain migration works. But I don't want uh, any of those proposals to lead anybody to think that I am not pro-immigration. Again, immigration, when done properly, can help to continue to make uh, America dynamic, continue to make it a melting pot, continue to make it the center of economic opportunity for the rest of the globe. And we have a great opportunity to make the reforms that are needed to make us even better in the future than we have been in the past. Mr. Brockman, you have something to add? Uh, just briefly, Don. You know, uh, that's right. And one of the things we can do, 40% of the people who are here undocumented, uh, not lawfully in the country, uh, came here by, and just overstayed lawful visas. And so we've got to start enforcing uh, on employers, and not just the low-level people who hire, but the CEOs who hire undocumented uh, immigrants, after a, a reasonable waiting period, hold them personally accountable uh, in law for hiring undocumented workers, unless they can show they complied with E-Verify. And if you're not serious about going through a process like that, uh, then we're not going to get a, uh, a handle on uh, undocumented workers. The second thing is we do need to continue to strengthen our borders. Okay, thank you both very much. Uh, you both talked about this earlier in the debate, but let's get back to it because it's so important to Kettle Land. The Farm Bill expired on September 30th, and as of tonight, Congress still cannot come to an agreement. 
Why is it taking so long? And if it's not passed by the time you're sworn in, what will you do? Mr. Johnson. Well, there are parts of the Senate bill that I like, and there are parts of the House bill that I like. And like anything in Congress, you know, we are going to have to get together. So one of the things, and, and I got to tell everybody, I'm going to work my tail off to get on the Ag Committee. Uh, I've had experience uh, with that farm bill, both in the public sector and in the private sector. I understand it. Uh, you know, I have read all 700 pages of the House draft. I mean, I understand that farm bill inside and out. So I understand the weaknesses in each version. So one of the things that I want to do when I get there is be a voice uh, to make sure that we're willing to compromise. Come together. I know sometimes we think that can be a, a dirty word. But the reality is in any relationship I've ever had, I've never gotten a whole loaf. I don't get a whole loaf when I talk with my wife. I don't get a whole loaf at the office. Uh, when I'm trying to uh, figure out how we're going to run Sunday school, I mean, I don't get a whole loaf with my co-teachers. I mean, the reality is we need to be willing to find some common ground. And so I, I feel, for instance, that uh, a very, an incredibly strong part of the House bill is that it says that if you're on food stamps, if you're an able-bodied non-senior who doesn't have children at home, you should work or go to job training 20 hours a week. That is an incredibly important part of the American story. We have millions of people, I mean, Tim mentioned, we have millions of people who could work but who aren't. And part of the reason that they're not working is, is that our welfare system doesn't expect more from them. It doesn't instill in them the idea that work is not punishment, work is opportunity. And that is how your life is going to get better. So that's one part of the House bill that I would love to see retained. But I'm going to be honest. If we can't get that through the Senate, I'm not going to destroy the entirety of the farm bill because I don't get all of my way. So part of this is going to be a little bit of giving and taking, and I will be a voice, a common sense voice, to make sure that we get that thing done so that we have the predictability we need for South Dakota producers. Mr. Bjorkman, how do we get a farm bill passed? Yeah, well, you know, the, the Senate passed their version 86 to 11 done. And the House barely got it through because it's so highly partisan that even the Senate Ag Committee chairman, a Republican, condemned its partisanship. Dusty and I both read that farm bill. Uh, Dusty pronounced it uh, a good bill before uh, the House or the Senate Ag Committee chairman condemned it. Here's the problem with it. It allows Wall Street investors and others who have never set foot on a farm to take corporate welfare. Dusty wants to talk about uh, workfare on, on the food stamp end, and I support workfare, but it's already in the law. Uh, we've got to address the corporate welfare because that's taken away money for conservation under this current house farm bill. It's taken away um, money for uh, startup farming, for promoting ethanol, and it's uh, limited the veteran farmer opportunities. So the problem is that we need to work across the aisle and it didn't happen on the House side. We both want to be on the House Ag Committee. I know how to work and advocate for farmers. I was there fighting for family farms in the 80s. I understand what they need and they need predictability and they need an advocate for the, for the family farm, not the big corporate farm, uh, which takes already 80% uh, of the benefits for 10% of the participants. Okay, we have to leave it there. You will be filling the seat of Congresswoman Christy Nome, and she served on the House Ag Committee until 2014 when she made the switch to the powerful Ways and Means Committee. Now, committees are often where the real work gets done in Congress. What committees do you hope to be on when you get sworn in to best serve South Dakotans? Mr. Bjorkman, we asked that question. Please answer within a minute or less. All right. Well, I, as I just mentioned, uh, House Ag is my first choice. I think that, uh, you know, we're an ag state. It's very important to us, Sammy, that, uh, you know, we get a member from South Dakota on that committee again who understands farming, production, agriculture, and understands uh, family farmers. Uh, after that, judiciary, natural resources, uh, we have a huge uh, native population that needs an advocate, and I want to be there to help them. All right. Thank you, Mr. Bjorkman. Mr. Johnson, which committees would you like to be on? Yeah, well, we've already talked about my interest in the Agricultural Committee, and, and in part I, I'm so passionate about that because I have a lot of experience uh, working in rural America, working for rural America, 
And, and it, that dovetails pretty well with my second choice, would be, which would be transportation and infrastructure. And that really is the common theme, infrastructure, throughout my career, uh, whether it's been from uh, constructing broadband uh, to roads and bridges uh, to electrical transmission lines. Those are the kind of things I have done. And both of those committees have traditionally been an area where you've been able to find some bipartisan support. And so I'm looking forward to making sure we can get some good things done for this country. All right, thank you both. Now we have time for the candidates to each give us their final statements. Our U.S. House debate continues in less than two minutes. As we've all seen, Twitter is a common form of communication with the current president, but also with each of you. So we want to know what will be your first tweet in office, Mr. Johnson, in 30 seconds or less. Uh, my first tweet in office is going to be to thank the people of South Dakota for the incredible honor they've given me. And I won't ever doubt that when I raise my hand to take an oath, uh, it's going to be to the Constitution and uh, to the people of uh, the United States of America. And my bosses are the folks of South Dakota. So thank you would be the first tweet. Nice. Okay. Mr. Bjorkman. My first tweet is uh, that I will do everything I can to fulfill my promise to you uh, to be the strong, independent voice for South Dakota that we need and deserve in Congress, independent of both the special interests and the national party bosses. Thank you both. Well, they've spent the last hour answering your questions. Now they have one last chance to try to win your vote. They each have one minute for a closing statement, <coughs> and we are going to begin with Mr. Johnson. Well, thank you, everybody, for your time tonight. And in the last 18 months, I haven't slowed down. Uh, I've driven 100,000 miles. I've shaken a quarter million hands. Uh, I've been to your communities, and I've talked to you about how we can make South Dakota an even better place to live, to work, uh, build a business, raise a family. And overwhelmingly, what I've heard from you is that you don't think we need a much bigger, more intrusive federal government to make those things happen. And those are my values, too. I don't think we need a lot more federal spending to be able to create more economic opportunity for this country. In fact, sometimes we just need the federal government to get out of the way. We've rolled back 2,000 regulations in the last couple of years, and we see the kind of incredible economic impact that that has had on this country. And so I'm going to be a voice, a consistent voice, saying maybe we need a little bit less D.C. and a lot more South Dakota. I'm Dusty Johnson, and I'm really looking forward to earning your vote between now and November 6th. Thanks. All right, thanks a lot, Mr. Johnson. And of course, we flipped the coin to see who would go last. And Mr. Bjorkman, you chose to go last. You have one minute for your closing statement. Thank you, Don. You know, most of us aren't that political. We just want government to work. And so rather than dialing for dollars like is traditional in campaigns today, I reject that kind of politics. I traveled all across our state to 180 communities from Edgemont to Eden and Buffalo to Vermillion, and I listened to you. I heard you say, we need an authentic voice for the people again who will put country over political careers. This election isn't about the, the political right and the political left. It's about right and wrong. So let's, let's join together and clean up Congress. And let's start building strong families and communities again. You know, so much of life is out of our control. But one thing you do control, on November 6th, in the quiet of a booth, you get to choose who speaks for you in Congress. Let me be your voice. Thanks and God bless. All right. We'd like to take this opportunity to thank both of you for participating yes. in tonight's U.S. House debate. Whoever wins the U.S. House of Representative seat will take over for Republican Christy Nome. Meanwhile, she is in a heated race with Democrat Billy Sutton to be South Dakota's next governor. Don't forget, we have a debate next Tuesday at 7 p.m. Central Time right here on Kelloland TV. And in addition to the races, there are five ballot issues. Before you head to the polls, you'll be want to be sure to join us for Inside Kelloland Ballot Issues Explained. It's a week from Sunday. We will go through the ballot and look at both sides of every issue. And don't forget, the election is 18 days from today. From the, today, and the voter registration deadline, by the way, is mm -hmm. Monday. Kelloland.com is your home for the election-related resources. Head there before you go vote. Then the polls are open from 7 until 7 in each of our time zones. And you'll want to be sure to stay with Kelloland News and Kelloland.com throughout the day. We will bring you live coverage from the polls. Plus, we will have fast, accurate results. Thank you for joining us tonight.